here in Singapore um, and acts in part to launch an excellent new report on the future of sustainable trade, uh, which the foundation has just launched and which you'll hear about uh, in just a second. My name is James Crabtree. I'm going to be your chair and host for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, what we're going to do today uh, is we're going to hear initially from our Dean at the Lee Kuan Yew School, Danny Kwa, and Danny is going to welcome you to this event. Then we will hear a presentation uh, from Stephen Olson, an economist with the Hinrich Foundation, uh, and he will give an overview uh, of their recent report. And then we're going to have a panel discussion, which I will uh, introduce shortly, after which we'll open up to question and answers from the audience. Uh, so in a sense, you have three pieces of entertainment in one event. So I hope this will be a, a terrific discussion. Uh, all I would say is that there are a few more important topics uh, in Asia at the moment than the post-pandemic recovery and the future direction of globalization. And although in the short term, uh, much focus has been on regional trade and its recovery from the recent RCEP agreement uh, through to some really quite hair-raising trade figures that occurred earlier in the year uh, in the immediate aftermath of the lockdowns. But as we emerge, hopefully next year, with a vaccine and a return to a path to normal, focus is going to uh, grow ever more closely on how trade can contribute to a greener and more sustainable future. Uh, with the latest COP meeting in the UK uh, coming up and uh, the, the challenge of reaching targets to secure a world with 1.5 to 2 degree warming getting uh, no easier over time. And so the kind of ideas that are in this report we're going to talk about today uh, have hardly, uh, could hardly come at a more important time. So with that, let me hand over to our Dean Danny Kwa to make a formal welcome to all of you today at this event. So Danny, over to you. And welcome everyone to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. As, as James has so so uh, so kindly uh, introduced all the, the actors that are going to be coming, you know already that this is a joint event this evening that the school has organized together with the Hindering Foundation. You know that in a few minutes, Mr. Stephen Olson will make a presentation on the foundation's new sustainable trade report. And then after that, there will be a panel discussion on the race for a new, greener globalization. The panel will, in other words, all of the conversation this afternoon will look at how the world can together bring about inclusive global growth through sustainable trade. First, a better, more inclusive, sustainable globalization. Now, as we go into this, I wanted to, to just reflect that some of us in this audience are old enough to remember something that we now call the Battle of Seattle, the 1999 protests that took place in the American city of Seattle against the World Trade Organization. And of course, when I say some of us in the audience are old enough, I mean just me. So for those of us who took part in the heat of that Seattle conversation, the idea that one day globalization might be greener, better, more inclusive, sustainable, might seem a profoundly oxymoronic, self-contradicting hybrid. Now, to be very clear, my own idealized view is that in principle, globalization could be the most inclusive force at work on our planet. And what I mean by that is that if we take globalization to mean the increasing ease with which everything becomes available to ever more of us, wherever we are on the planet, at ever lower cost. What could be more inclusive than that? But of course, while that is what globalization might be in principle, in practice, it often comes out harsh, exclusive, divisive, and destructive. Seattle 1999 was one long massive street protest against a ministerial conference that sought to launch a new round of economic globalization. That battle brought together a range of loosely organized groups that were concerned furiously about inequality, about the natural environment, about consumer protection, worker safeguards, religious conscience, 
student worries for their global future. It was a different time, but the ideas have remained the same. What characterized that conversation then between globalization on the one hand and greed on the other was street vandalism, property destruction, and civil disobedience. In sharp contrast, I am sure that this evening, James Crabtree, our moderator, will keep everything well under control. This panel, Mr. Olson, will dissect data and evidence. They will talk about metrics of measurements. They will talk about analytical trade-offs between economic gains and social imperatives. They'll talk about stewardship for the future versus consumption today. All forces at work in today's new green globalization. One of the centerpieces in the conversation this evening will be the Hinrich Foundation Sustainable Trade Index, a report prepared by the Economist Intelligence Unit, tracking the critical juncture between trade and sustainability of 20 Indo-Pacific economies. And invariably, when you do that, there will, of course, be exciting league tables. Who's on top? Who has improved? Who has fallen behind? There will be surprises as we go through this report. We will see old ideas about how there are opposing trade-offs and thinking about green and globalization will, after all, have looked at the challenge all wrong. Instead of humanity facing a sharp trade-off, actually doing good in one axis will turn out in circumstances to do good in the other axis as well. But listen, that's a treat ahead of you. All of that discussion is to come. Once again, welcome everyone to this Lee Kuan Yew School Henrik Foundation event. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing and reading your participation actively in the Q&A session, as in the panel discussion and presentation. Welcome, and if I may, let me now turn you back to the moderator, James Crabtree, and then the next speaker, Stephen Olson. Thank you all very much. Back to you, James. Very good, Danny. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, I, we will endeavor under my chairmanship to avoid any Seattle-style scenes uh, although it is my hope that we may get at least a debate and discussion amongst our panelists. We, at least Kuan Yew School, believe in robust uh, debate and argument. And so with a bit of luck, we will have that. And to provide the, the prelude uh, uh, and, and the intellectual uh, uh, inspiration to this, I'd now like to turn to Stephen Olson. So Stephen uh, is a research fellow at the Henrik Foundation, but also um, one of a, a real must follow on social media and in his other writing about issues of regional trade more generally. So as the Henrik Foundation has crafted a really valuable role for itself as one of the key thinking institutions around Asia, looking at all aspects uh, of the, the regional trade economy. So Stephen uh, has become one of the leading commentators and intellectuals out there in the world making arguments about the changing nature of trade in the region. So Stephen, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here joining us this afternoon uh, from Bangkok. Um, so let me hand over to you. I think you're going to show us some slides and, and give us a kind of sense of what's in this report. Well, thank you, uh, James, very much uh, for that very kind in, in, uh, introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Heinrich Foundation, a, a very warm thank you to the LKY School uh, for organizing uh, today's event. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as has been mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about uh, sustainable trade in particular, the Heinrich Foundation Sustainable Trade Index. Now, I have just a, a couple of slides I'd like to walk you through. So if you uh, bear with me for a half a second and keep your fingers crossed that I don't screw anything up, I will attempt to share my slides, which I believe I have done. All right. Probably uh, uh, the logical place for us to begin our discussion on sustainable trade is with a definition. When we refer to sustainable trade, what exactly are we talking about? Well, essentially uh, sustainable trade is engaging in international trade in a way that not only generates balanced economic growth, uh, but also strengthens social capital and provides for environmental stewardship. Now, we, we recognize, of course, that trade is an indispensable ingredient in economic development, 
but it cannot be pursued sustainably. And I would really triple underline that word sustainably without an equivalent uh, commitment to social capital and the environment. Um, these, these concepts, of course, were, were first laid out by the landmark work of the 1987 uh, UN Brundtland Commission, uh, which established the three pillars of uh, sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. Uh, perhaps some of you are more familiar with this as the triple bottom line or the three Ps, profits, uh, people, and planet. Now, in terms of the index, the Sustainable Trade Index or STI itself, uh, it evaluates 19 uh, Asian economies plus the United States as an external benchmark across those three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. Uh, we commissioned the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, to produce the index for us. It's based on a very comprehensive uh, literature review uh, expert consultations, and a series of what I can assure you were very intensive and very uh, exhaustive workshops that we held uh, at the Heinrich Foundation. At the end of that process, we ended up uh, with an index structure that consisted of uh, 15 indicators under the economic pillar, five under the social pillar, and seven under the environmental. Now, important point, after a lot of discussion and debate, we ultimately came to the conclusion that each of these three pillars should be weighted equally. So economic pillar is worth one third, social pillar is worth one third, and environmental pillar is worth one third. Now, if you think we got that wrong, if you think we made a mistake, I've got good news for you. You can uh, download an interactive version of the index at heinrichfoundation.com. You can go into the index. You can reconfigure those weights any way your heart desires in whatever way you think makes more sense than the way that we did it. And then you can rerun the results of the index to see how it would change the, the, the rankings. Okay. Now, in terms of the results from the uh, 2020 index, I'll just uh, briefly mention a couple of things quickly. Uh, for, for the first time in the history of the index, we had a tie at the top of the index uh, for the top slot between Japan and South Korea. Then we had a bit of a drop off and the next four economies, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the United States were bunched together uh, fairly tightly. Now, if you're, if you're looking at that sixth place finish for the United States and, and wondering if that is a bit of an underperformance, um, the short answer is yes. Uh, it is a bit of an underperformance uh, on the part uh, of the United States. Um, the key factor dragging down the, the score of the United States, and I don't think this will come as a, as a major surprise to anybody, uh, but uh, it's the large number of tariff and non-tariff measures uh, that the United States has put into place uh, in, in recent years. Now, of course, as we were constructing the 2020 index uh, during this remarkable year that we're all living through, um, the proceedings were, there, there was a, a cloud hanging over the proceedings, which was of course the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, which raised of course the, the very important question in our minds well, look, over, over the longer term, what is going to be the impact of this experience of the pandemic on sustainable trade? Over the longer term, uh, will, will the experience of the pandemic uh, ultimately help or hinder the achievement of sustainable trade? Well, of course, we don't know the answer. Uh, it's, it's simply too early in the process to draw any uh, definitive conclusions. Uh, but on an initial basis, I can tell you that I see some reasons for optimism and some reasons for pessimism. Unfortunately, uh, we know that anytime countries are under any form of economic duress, it can heighten the temptation for them to attempt to take shortcuts to growth, to employment uh, by re uh, reducing labor or environmental standards. 
Now, of course, uh, this is a mistake and it will always backfire uh, over the longer term, yet we recognize that this is a, this is a temptation uh, that exists and is probably, and this temptation has probably risen uh, during the pandemic. And in fact, we've already seen countries from, from India to the United States that have succumbed to this pressure. Um, in India, uh, several states have reduced uh, labor standards specifically in, a, in, a, in an attempt to try to generate economic activity. And in the United States, the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency uh, has rolled back uh, the requirement for uh, environmental impact assessments, uh, which typically, uh, which, which typically uh, accompany uh, uh, large infrastructure projects. Uh, more recently, and, and this is something that, that many of you, I imagine, took note of, um, the government of Indonesia passed a very large omnibus reform bill. Now, Indonesia is, is, appears poised uh, to tip into its first recession since the Asian financial crisis. And uh, the government has embarked upon this reform measure uh, specifically as a means to help encourage foreign direct investment uh, entering into Indonesia. Uh, and I, I do have to say the, the, the reform bill does accomplish some, some positive things. It does reduce some of the uh, Byzantine uh, red tape uh, that can make it so difficult to, to do business in Indonesia. I think we'd all agree that's a positive thing. Um, but unfortunately, it also reduces uh, some labor and environmental protections. So in, in essence, Indonesia is wagering that it can benefit by pursuing less sustainability. Its, it's implicit calculation is that lower labor and environmental standards uh, will make Indonesia more attractive to foreign investors. Um, and I would, I would suggest to you that there is, there is ample reason to believe that that assumption uh, might be incorrect. Um, these old cliched notions which still stick around, unfortunately, uh, about businesses being very eager to engage in a race to the bottom and rush into countries in order to take advantage of lower uh, labor and environmental standards is rapidly falling out of sync with, with current day realities. Uh, companies are now rapidly understanding that such an approach simply doesn't make good business sense over the longer term. And it also runs contrary to the values held by their customers, their investors, and even their own employees and the employees that they, that they hope to recruit in the future. And so we're, we're seeing that uh, in many instances, businesses are now getting out in front of government in the, in the, in the move towards greater uh, sustainability. And this is something that, that I'm happy to report that we saw specifically uh, with regard to the reform, the Indonesian reform bill uh, that I just mentioned to you. Um, almost as soon as the Indonesian government uh, made its, its intentions clear, a group of about 35 major investment funds with about $4 trillion in assets under management sent a very blunt, a very pointed letter to the Indonesian government. And they said just point blank, do not do this. You are making a mistake. If you reduce labor and environmental standards in Indonesia, you are not going to make the country more attractive for investment. You are going to make the country less attractive for investment. And this, this really struck me as quite, as quite profound and gave me at least some reason uh, to feel a certain degree of encouragement. Um, I'll point uh, uh, to, uh, to, to one other item that I think also uh, should give all of us reason for, to have at least a bit of, of encouragement and, and optimism. Um, of course, in, in the aftermath of the, the economic slowdown generated as a result of the pandemic, we're seeing countries around the world initiating stimulus programs to generate economic activity. I'm really struck 
by how many of these stimulus programs condition the funding on the recipient, be it a government agency, be it a private business, whatever the case might be, um, makes that funding contingent on those entity, entities conducting their operations in increasingly sustainable ways. Um, and I think that gives us, I think that gives us reason at least to hope that this concept of build back better uh, actually ends up being more than just a, uh, a bumper sticker or a phrase and actually takes root across business, government, and, and civil society. That at a minimum, I would say, is our, is our hope. So I think I'll, I'll draw my uh, comments to a close there. I'll uh, look forward to what I'm sure will be an interesting panel discussion and then uh, any questions that might arise. Thank you very much. Very good. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Would you mind unsharing your screen? Uh, and then we will return to the panel, but that was an excellent introduction. Um, I put the link to the, the Henrik Foundation report in the chat, um, so you can go and have a look at that, although not now, because now I would like you to listen to our panel discussion. Um, and so I want to introduce, if they might be kind enough to unmute themselves, uh, our, our three speakers. So. Uh, beginning us, joining us this afternoon uh, in a very fetching looking library uh, is Arunaba Ghosh, uh, joining from New Delhi. Uh, Arunaba is the founder of uh, the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, which is a fantastic think tank uh, in, in Delhi. But, but prior to that, back in the day, also used to work at the WTO and therefore brings together an unusual uh, mixture of knowledge on climate sustainability and trade. Uh, then joining us from Manila, we have Sophia Shakil, um, who is the Director of Economic Development at the Asia Foundation uh, and has a, a, a storied background um, in the, the intersection of economic development um, and issues of inequality uh, and economic growth in Asia, also at the Asia Development Bank. So welcome to you today, Sophia. And, and last but not least, uh, joining us from uh, not his own office, but with the background he tells me, which is his own office, uh, we have Professor Ben Kishor. Ben is the Lee Cushing Professor of Public Management here at the Lee Kuan Yew School and co-director of our Institute uh, on Water Policy. Um, and so what we're going to do now is I'm going, we're going to have an open question and answer, a sort of Q&A session discussion between ourselves about the report um, in which I'm first going to ask our panelists to, to give some thoughts on the report and then we'll talk more broadly about the future direction of trade uh, in light of the kind of things that Stephen has just talked about. So it's social labor and in particular it's climate and sustainability um, perspective. So Aranaba, can I turn to you first? I mean, we, this exists within a kind of broader geopolitical context, which, which Stephen often comments on, but, but didn't touch on too much on this occasion, which is what we might call deglobalization and the geopolitics of, of trade, and, and particularly the trade war between the, the US and China. I know that you had some thoughts on, on how that might play into this issue of how trade should be viewed from a sustainability and environmental framework. So, so could I ask you to, to sort of start from there and then we'll go around the group and continue. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, James. And uh, many thanks, uh, Stephen, for your briefing presentation. It's um, a really interesting report. And thanks, James, for bringing us all together to discuss this. Now, before I comment on the report and the, your question, I wanted to just pick up on something that Danny Kwa said right at the outset. He brought our attention back to those riots in Seattle when we were discussing the so-called Singapore issues in, in global trade. Right. Um, now, the, the context, however, has changed. We have to recognize that. And what has changed in the trade world in terms of the context? Number one, the same Singapore issues um, are no longer completely toxic in terms of conversation, right? Uh, whether they are formally embedded into WTO law or not, as Stephen was presenting, you know, there are still... Um, investing uh, companies, there are still banks, there are uh, corporations who are taking these issues seriously. Whether it's their environmental standards, whether it's your labor standards, um, your, whether it's your, basically your social license to operate. So that's one fundamental change that has happened in 20 years um, since the Seattle riots. The second thing that has happened, unfortunately though, 
is that whether we have a deglobalization or not, we certainly have had a recession from a belief in multilateral trading systems. And this is problematic because then we again open up um, a, into a world where my standards could be different from your standards, but I can't find a common ground because we don't have a common forum at which we choose to resolve our differences. And the third thing that has happened between late 90s and now is that the world has gone through three crises. The financial crisis in 97, 98, the global financial crisis in 2008, and now the pandemic induced crisis. But this pandemic induced crisis is the one that is resulting in the maximum amount of sort of renationalization. Um, this belief that I can concentrate all my production and my supply chains within my own economy, I can become self-reliant on my own um, at the cost of everybody else. And when everybody thinks like that, we're entering into a dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. So this, we have to keep in mind that whether we discuss economic sustainability or environmental sustainability or social sustainability, these three fundamental changes that have happened over the last two decades uh, will inform the kind of solutions we come up with. One of the things that I took away therefore from this report was where are we finding convergence and where are we finding divergence? There is that the rankings are packed in a lot more in the context of your economic parameters. So that's good news in some ways that everybody is creeping up towards a higher standard of uh, income and wealth or, 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 or standard of living. Uh, but there is far more divergence when we look at the other parameters, particularly the environmental ones. So, now we are in a situation where we are schizophrenic at one level with our investors telling us, hey, take these issues seriously, but our actual performance is still far more divergent than the economic convergence. E econ 101 or development econ 101 talks about the economic convergence. Latecomers to development can also aspire to eventual higher high standards of living. But how do we now convert our thinking, our curricula, our, our standards, our investing metrics into convergence on the other metrics as well, right? When we have that, then maybe we will not be so worried about decoupling and renationalization because we will see that the standards are similar everywhere and you're aspiring to a different mo mode of production and consumption as the SDGs ask us to do. Very good. Okay, thank you. Well, we might come back to this issue of decoupling and in a sense the challenges it presents. I see we've already got a question uh, from Abhishek Bhatia joining us on Facebook. So I should have said that, that please do, if you're on Facebook, uh, then, then throw questions into the chat and our brilliant team uh, will fish them out so that we'll know them. And if you're watching live on the Zoom platform, you can just put questions in the Q&A. Um, so that's great. Sophia, can I turn to, to, to you next? Oh. I mean, the, Asia Foundation, you deal more with the perhaps the the, the social side of, of Stevens Index. So I, I wonder what reflections you might give us on, on in a sense, how you see that picture developing, mm -hmm. whether there's cause for optimism. I imagine the pandemic, uh, as the, the report suggests, has not been a, a great time for the kind of indicators that the Asia Foundation cares about, but, but maybe paint a picture for us of how you see this is developing. No, uh, first of all, um, I really want to thank, um, you know, Stephen for such a good presentation and, and you know, the Heinrich Foundation for putting this out. Um, I want to pick up on initially just one of the points that Professor Ghosh made, which is about the shifts that took place. And I think I would add to that that there are two very important shifts during the same time that impact what's happening in terms of sustainable growth and, and you know, and, and, and inclusive um economic opportunities. One is obviously, which is the more, you know, glaring one, which, which is the digital transformation and digital transformation in the economy. So whether it's manufacturing, it's just more of an advent of the gig economy and services that are being um, delivered through that. We have to be cognizant that those are two, that's a very important shift. 
and what that will imply. And the other one is the demographic shift. So the demographic shifts with societies that are aging on one hand in some of these countries, but on the other hand, still a, a, you know burdening, um, you know struggling to meet, uh, you know trying to deal with labor issues, but a young population that is may not be as big, but is much more cognizant of sustainable and environmental friendly, um, you know, practices. These are going to be important factors. But what I want to pick up on, as James was saying, and that's my takeaway from, you know, from this is that, you know, when you look at the index, and as you said, sustainable trade, you know, one key aspect of it is that it is dependent on strengthening social capital. And that's where the people, um, the human development side comes in. And most importantly, people, as long as along with the skills they have, the opportunities they have, and their livelihoods. So if you look at that index, what struck me, and this is my takeaway, is that, you know, again, you've got the bunching of the, the Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan on, on the top. And then if you go down below, as you get down there, you've got, you know, Let's say you pick out the South Asian countries. You've still got Sri Lanka and Bangladesh faring relatively better and then Pakistan at the end. And what strikes me always as a human development economist is that they're, you know, you're not going to achieve sustainable development growth without investing in the human development angle. The skills, uh, basic education, of course, we know that, but, but the skills. And even with this transformation that I was mentioning, the digital transformation of the economy, unless we invest in digital literacy um, with these diversifying value chains, we're going to see a lot more people, especially some of the vulnerable workers left behind. And without that foundation of the people, the P in, you know, in, in that index, it's not going to, I see quite a bit of challenge, but they're also going to be the backbone of helping to build and rebuild and carry that forward. So I'm going to stop there for now, but that's uh, what I see. Is very good, very good. Now that, that that's terrific. I mean, in a sense, the strength of this report is the way that the Henry Foundation are trying to bring together the, the sustainability and human development and other other angles, along with a, a more orthodox approach to trade liberalisation as well, and to try and kind of bring this together in one piece. Ben, can I can I turn to you? Uh, I mean, you're a you're a long time expert on on climate and other forms of sustainability, and so I'm sure you'll you'll have plenty of thoughts on this. But maybe could you give us a, a sort of initial reflection on what what Stephen said, um, and also what our other panelists have put on the table? Yeah, first of all, I uh, uh, just want to thank Stephen for a wonderful presentation and for the report from the Heinrich Foundation. It's a really wonderful, deliberative, careful report on the really critical challenges facing how do we think about environment, social, and economic uh, values together. Uh, so congrats on that. Um, I, and I think also it's important that Stephen highlighted this, this challenge that we have in the global era, which is how do we think about a race to the top where we have companies trying to improve their environmental and social performance while doing good for their shareholders, or the race to the bottom where companies flee to the the easier places to invest without these kinds of protections. And this is a constant theme in the last 30 years in both practice and scholarship on sustainable development. How do we foster a race to the top? And of course, the questions of standardization across supply chains often leads to a race to the middle in many cases. So how do we do the top? How do we get to the top? And I wanna raise two themes to think about in this conversation. Um, so um, one is pathways. And one is problems. So in Pathways, there's a very famous political scientist who works on trade and the environment named David Vogel. And he noticed that thinking of da Dean Danny's point about Seattle, that it wasn't always the case that economic globalization led to a race to the bottom. In fact, he found that in many cases, you saw a race to the top. And he asked the question, well, why would you sometimes see companies actually trying to improve and increase standards that seem counterintuitive to just making money. And he, he said um, that when you get a race to the top, one of the reasons you do so is because of what he called the California effect. Okay, the California effect this is a very important term for our conversation because what he noticed was in California, by the way, California loves rules. Okay, they just love rules in California, all kinds of rules, okay. 
Uh, they lead the world in rules on everything, environment, social, you have it, right? So Vogel found that companies who were based in California were actually aligning with environmental activists to try and increase rules on their competitors, first in the United States and other states, and then even nationally, and then globally through the gap in the WTO. And he thought, well, why is this? And the answer was that these companies saw it in a strategic self-interest to increase rules so they could have a level playing field. And that meant um, promoting both their bottom line and a social good at the same time, okay? So this California effect is important because it led to trade and the environment going up at the same time, okay? But the trigger for the California effect was a rule, a very strong rule on the environment that the companies initially did not like because it put them at a competitive disadvantage. But when it was clear that California was not gonna back down, the companies then went global. So how we think about the mix of public policy and trade together in a, in, a, in a mix in a basket to foster the California effect is I think really important in this conversation about whether we get a race at the top or a race at the bottom. Because Vogel also said, what you want to avoid is the Delaware effect. And Stephen talked about this in, in, the, in the Indonesian case. And this is when companies flee to the places with the least regulations. And at the time, Delaware led the United States in the fewest regulations, right? So both are happening simultaneously at the same time. And I think our job as a community and what the Hunger Foundation lays the ground for is how do we think about then helping that triple bottom line to go up, not down, okay? That's the pathways theme that I think is very important. But also important is the problems theme. So as we all know, the last 25 years has not been a great story for the environment whether it's measured as in the climate catastrophe and the 1.5 degree imperative that scientists tell us is fundamental for averting catastrophic ecological effects of the world's biosphere and the massive species extinctions crisis of 1 million species being now threatened with extinction because of globalization and commodification of nature. So it is not always the case that the California effect helps with the biodiversity crisis, because you still need growth to do that. And sometimes you simply have a trade-off between protection of nature and harvesting nature for communities, social inclusion, increasing wealth, and so on. And so those tough choices, I think we need a, we need a more important and broader conversation about, because it is not always the case that there will always be a triple bottom line when it comes to the one million species threatened with extinction. And so how we handle that is a question that I think governments, Hunter Foundation, all of us need to think about deliberately versus thinking there's always going to be always a positive sum game and all these questions, because there just simply is not in all cases. Very good. Okay, those are some excellent introductory thoughts. And thanks for those of you. We've got a few good questions coming in. We'll leave the last 15 minutes uh, for, for audience Q&A. So we'll, we'll come to those in a minute. Um, Aranaba, can I come back to you? So in a sense, what, what I was asking before, so Ben mentioned the the, 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 if you're thinking about globalization, one of the theoretical benefits of having globalization is you get standardization, and and so you can you can raise standards. Uh, and I wondered, in an era in which people talk a lot about deglobalization, in which people like Stephen are constantly talking about trade wars, could you just say a little bit more about the the risk from the the big picture of globalization to uh, uh, the kind of objectives that you care about, or alternatively, did you see it in a more positive sense that actually the era of hyper-globalization wasn't much good for, for, for sustainable outcomes, and therefore maybe there's something more positive to look forward to in this new, more fragmented era? James, the uh, era of hyper-globalization, as you describe it, um, the the problem was not that we were globalizing or integrating our economies. The problem was that we were not delivering on at least the implicit social contract that we had with labor uh, about sharing the benefits of that integration. Uh, this is a story that has unfolded ever since the NAFTA negotiations and then the WTO negotiations, uh, I mean, or rather the Uruguay round negotiations that have created the WTO or the so-called Doha development round that really not resulted in much. 
But really, the reason there is this backlash is because, you know, in the United States, real wages haven't ri ri risen in, in, in 40 years. You've written about this, uh, James, about the increasing divergence in the way wealth is created and the way wealth is distributed. So my issue here is that if we use deglobalization as the, as the sort of response in the kind of situation we are in, we have to recover from this pandemic, then we will throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it'll happen in two different ways. The first is that at least say the work that we at CW have done with small businesses in India, we see that the more you're integrated into the longer supply chains of larger corporations, and the more those larger corporations are competing in global markets, your own standards keep rising. Your own incentives to invest in energy efficiency or in cleaner technologies are higher. If you don't do that, if you are a little kind of in a bubble of small businesses in some you know, conclave somewhere in the middle of India, um, and you're not integrated into supply chains, you of course damage the environment, but you also damage your own competitiveness because you're not investing in the technologies that actually makes you competitive in the longer run. That's one problem at a microeconomic firm level. But at a macroeconomic level, there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is what is the pathway, just to use the words that Ben brought up, what is the pathway out of the pandemic? And I believe we need to strike a new social contract on jobs, growth, and sustainability not treat these three as an impossible trinity that we can't ever achieve all three at the same time, but in fact realize this is the only pathway out of the pandemic. Now, how do you do that? You have to decentralize production while you increase the, the linkages through the supply chains. That creates local jobs, local value, but with the integration of the supply chains, you still have the incentive to upgrade on the other standards you're looking for. And on sector after sector, whether it's energy, whether it's water waste management, whether it is land management, uh, we see far more jobs that could be created than in sort of vertically integrated large conglomerates, et cetera. So how do we then break this jinx between an either or of hyper-globalization but no distribution of the welfare and a complete deglobalization, which then reduces my incentives to upgrade my standards at all? There is a middle path, and that's jobs, growth, and sustainability. So that's a fascinating way of thinking about it. And I want to, in a sense, turn in a minute to Sophia and Ben and ask for their thoughts on how we build back better. But just give us another minute on that, Ronaba, because it's a very neat distinction. So you say there is a path in which you can decentralize production in a way that will provide jobs, but doesn't lose the standard setting integration kind of raising the bar effect of globalization. But how on earth do you do that? Because typically that hasn't been the way that things have happened. Do you have examples in mind of, of kind of ways in which we can do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let me give you two examples very quickly. Uh, let's take cooling. You know, uh, the late Lee Kuan Yew said, um, the air conditioner is perhaps the most important invention of the 20th, 20th century. And that's perhaps true. People in hot, humid climates like Singapore or India need uh, decent ambient uh, conditions to work and be productive. Now, in a country like India, for instance, over the next two decades, we're gonna have the fastest growth in cooling demand in the world. Uh, and many other tropical countries are gonna grow, go through a major increase in cooling demand. Now, this sounds like, you know, what has this got to do with trade, right? Uh, but here's the thing. The air conditioner here I have in my home is a Samsung air conditioner, right? So it's designed in Korea, perhaps assembled in parts in Vietnam or something and fully packaged and delivered to me in India, right? That's part of the existing supply chains that we have. However, the local jobs that get created are in the after installation, in the sales and service, mm -hmm. right? We estimate that in India, technicians in the air conditioning sector alone will grow from 200,000 to 2 million in the next two decades, right? Now, this is, I, I'm using a very niche example, but a big growth story where now if you include issues of improved building design, passive cooling, better refrigerants, low carbon technologies for cooling, you're opening up something that seemed like a very dry niche little part of the industry 
consumer electronics into something that could open up a lot more opportunities in terms of R&D, production, installation, and servicing, right? Give, give me a minute to give one more example. Distributed energy. We import more than 80% of our solar panels from China. For Partly for energy security, et cetera, we have an objective of trying to increase production in India. But the real jobs get created, again, in the installation of these solar panels. However, here's the interesting part. Utility scale solar creates more jobs than coal, but distributed solar creates more jobs than utility solar seven times, Yeah. right? So when I'm putting up solar installations on top of a hospital or a home or a shopping mall, I'm taking the same technology, which has a certain vertically integrated production process and converting it into a value chain that involves deployment, servicing, local job creation, and local business model innovation that allows for a lot more value sharing than just the production side. So I think Sophia was also referring to the nature of production has changed from the way, from the time when we drew up those rules. We have to recognize the different kind of economy we're entering mm -hmm. and design trade rules, sustainable trade rules accordingly. Oh, it's, it's fascinating. So thank you. Let me turn to Sophia yeah. and, and Ben, either to give thoughts on, on that point, which I think is really interesting, or well, Sophia or from the like human... to just pick up on what yeah, I, I don't know if I was just saying, you know, if I may just, you know, sort of pick, you know, continue with that. I think that you've hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, the, the, the regrowth and building back better is not going to happen without the jobs, growth and environment sustainability and green jobs. And then, of course, green skills are going to be key. And I'll give you just two examples. You use the one about the cooling, you know, the air conditioning. And I used to work on China in my days as the Asian Development Bank. And, um, you know, and I was helping, I was working in a number of provinces that were trying to embark upon meeting the um, Chinese government standards in, the, in their 12th and 13th five-year plans to move towards green, you know, green economy because of the obvious, you know, environmental issues that they had. And the heating demand, you know, is, is tremendous in China. And, it, in, and that's what was, you know, um, causing a lot of the air pollution throughout the winters. And so provinces, particularly those that were the heavy, that the, whose, whose regional economies depended on, let's say, coal mining and other resource depletion, they made a concerted effort to transform these economies towards green. And that can be done in two ways. One is to introduce cleaner technologies in, let's say, coal mining and production. So you can make, you know, while you're developing other and investing in other cleaner energy, um, you know, solutions, you're also trying to make the, the, the coal production as well as heat, you know, heating, using coal less polluting and then you're also trying to diversify the economy so trying to move towards less polluting industry services is the obvious one but then there's uh, you know others i also saw that during this process what's needed is an extreme amount of coordination that is being done by the planners the economic and political planners as well as those that are delivering you know delivering the skills that are going to help fuel that economic transformation. So skills for transformation is absolutely critical. And China is, you know, one example of, uh, you know, where they've done that really well and something, you know, some lessons, you know, some you were asking, like, you know, can you give some examples? On the other hand, you know, when I was working in Sri Lanka on, again, you know, Sri Lanka is, you know, poised for rapid growth and, you know, going towards upper middle income country status, what happens there? exactly this thing you could not find technicians that could do things like basic um servicing of air conditioners as just to pick up on your example but a whole range of things and that's where we saw that you know maybe it's not the public sector only that has to come in it's the actual companies that should be um investing in the skills and imparting that so I just want to, you know, round this and sort of end my point here by saying that green jobs and green sk skills are absolutely essential, but it requires um, coordinated effort on the part of the planners and, and then the service providers and, and, and businesses, because otherwise the people get left out. And Singapore is also a very good example of where 
um, you know, labor force workforce planning has gone hand in hand with the economic transformation of, of, of the country. Very good. Ben, do you, do you want to sort of pick up and re reflect on the di discussion so far, both what Aranaba said and, and Sophia as well? Yeah, I would like to. Um, and, and I appreciate the very robust and, and thoughtful conversation. Um, I want to challenge a little bit this idea that's emerging in the, in the panel that there is this always this triple bottom line, win, win, win uh, synergy across these challenges, because the evidence is a bit more nuanced. And I think we need to think about being a bit um, more targeted in the actual problems we're talking about. This is a very abstract conversation right now. So I want to get it kind of more concrete, okay? Um, one of the challenges in the biodiversity world is uh, that there's a desire to limit the industrialization of natural systems so that habitat can maintain ecosystem structure and function. Uh, that's one problem definition, and that's pretty critical for reversing the species uh, extinction crisis. Now, in almost all cases, um, this has a negative impact on the commodification of nature that's produced so many jobs, added value to economies, and improved livelihoods, OK? So these are, uh, one's a land use allocation question. And one's a question of how do you, in the, in, the, in the context of the commodification of nature, harvest sustainably. So you don't over harvest, you think about other impacts, you minimize the impact on the environment, but you don't actually um, reverse it because your whole business model is around converting nature to a more productive system. And they're both very important things to think about in the context of a forest. But the implications for the questions we're talking about now are very different. So let me give you an example of concrete. 25 years ago, eco-labeling emerged as a way to think about harnessing trade in the environment around biodiversity conservation. And, and one of the first global systems was called the Forest Stewardship Council, the FSC. And today you can buy FSC timber, you can buy FSC envelopes, a wonderful system, committed people to thinking about the triple bottom line. Now what's happened since then is that the deforestation question, unfortunately, hasn't been addressed very well by these systems, despite them trying very hard. But they've done a very good job of helping minimize the impacts of nature commodification on the environment. And they've actually brought in local peoples into thinking about how to make policies together. They've had some really good stories around balancing these interactions, but not a good story on the deforestation uh, away from primary forest question. So I would argue if you care about both questions, you want to think more carefully about when do you want to use traditional public policy, regardless of the effects on trade. So it's not a question of simply reducing trade barriers, but saying some things require public policy protection, and some things require actually supply chain governance to create standardization across systems. And I would suggest that on trade and the environment for eco-labeling, this can be a very good niche, but it can't replace the need for more purposeful public policies over conservation and biodiversity, where species simply need to actually reduce the impact of the commodity of uh, commodification of nature. Very good, Ben. So we've got about five minutes until we open up for questions. What I want to do is I want to ask all three of you, and I'll start with you, Ben. This is a huge area I recognize. We're talking about all of globalization here. We're looking forward to COP26 in the United Kingdom next year. We're thinking about building back better after the pandemic. We have the context of stimulus recovery packages around the region. But I suppose in both of you, imagine you were you know, king or queen for the day, and you got to pick a couple of policies that you think would make a big difference just for a couple of minutes each. Could, in your, could, could you give us a sense of what you would like to see policymakers, either at the national or global level, um, pull out of the bag in order to move this agenda forward? So Ben, I'll start with you, then Sophia, and then Arunaba, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Okay, I'd say uh, one answer on the climate side is a much stronger fo focus on mandatory reductions. So um, I'll give you one example where this happened uh, that influenced the climate case. And that was the case of ecological degradation that polluting factories were doing on the Great Lakes uh, in Canada and the United States creating acid rain. And the, the EPA brought in rules as the Canadian authorities saying, 
these factories must stop polluting these lakes. And they were binding rules. They weren't voluntary mechanisms. They weren't trade related efforts. They were binding rules. But what happened was economists and the economy responded and said, hey, we can meet these rules more effectively and with less cost by allowing factories to trade their um, pollution permits with each other. They get a much more cost effective uh, approach to binding rules. Um, and that worked quite well. But today we're saying it's a cost benefit calculation unless there's a profit maximization model, we can't address the ecology. So more we, the more we have binding rules, the more we can actually unleash innovation in the economy and innovation and in policy mixes to, to actually be in line with the problems we're facing rather than letting the market determine whether the problem can be addressed. Very good. Sophia, from the, the human development angle or, or however you choose well, to attack this. You know, if you're asking me if there's one, you know, one key policy measure if I was queen for the day, I think it would be about putting women in more leadership positions on um, critical, you know, decision making relating to um, climate change and building community resilience. I think we have to put women and promote women le leadership. And just say a little bit more about why. What, well, because flow from that. Well, I I really think, and then we've seen this throughout our work with um you know the work that we're doing with the Asia Foundation that whether it's working at um you know very local community level or with um, implementing partners, local governments, or whether it's a, at a higher policy level, you cannot bring about change unless you build coalitions. And what's missing often in that is the voice of the women because they usually right when right at the you know from the community level leadership household to community all the way up to political um we have seen and there's so much evidence that women just care much more for building you know a, a better environment and and more you know just clean the cleaner safer environment for their communities and and for society and i think we haven't done enough in putting women at the forefront very good. Okay, excellent. Arunaba, from your point of view, I mean, you run a think tank on this, so you've always got a million ideas, but, but pick a couple of them and give us a taste. I'll give you two. Um, the first one is a little bit related to what Ben was saying, which is that the policy has to come in to, to set the direction of travel and the pace of travel. It does not need to determine the technology that you use. So just like Ben, I mean, so I'm basically giving the converse of Ben's argument, but it's in the same same line. Ben is saying stop polluting, uh, and I'm saying on top of that, you say that look, here is my parameter. You know, my parameter could be the efficiency of my vehicle, the efficiency of the boiler in my plant, the efficiency of the air conditioner in my home. Right? I don't care how you get there, but here's my parameter, and there's going to be no exception no compromise on that uh, regularly restrictive parameter. Because unless you set that direction of travel, you're not gonna get innovation coming out. And we've seen this, you know, 20, 10 years ago, India had less than 20 megawatts of solar. It now has more than 90,000 megawatts of wind and solar. And it came primarily on a direction of travel that said, we're gonna have a big renewable energy target. And yes, there was some calculation, some cost benefit, et cetera, but a lot of it was also a leap of faith. And unless policy at least pushes you towards that leap of faith, you're not gonna get it. Um, the second thing is that we have to have a lot more focus on tail end risks. And one, I mean, it's not just financial disclosure in, ter in terms of you know, stranded assets, but if you're operating a steel plant, you're operating a power plant, you're operating, uh, a textile mill, doesn't matter if you are not disclosing to securities agencies, to your um, investors, to your shareholders of what are the tail and risks you're exposed to, you know, how will, you are not gonna be able to be respond to the planetary shocks that you're likely to face. The pandemic is one such tail and risk, climate change offers a lot more. And our obsession with looking at averages and thinking that I did little better than the last quarter and therefore I should get a million dollar bonus is gonna be the doom of economies and enterprises. 
Very good. Okay, so thank you very much for that. That was a terrific uh, discussion with some really good, uh, both practical ideas, but also big picture thoughts from uh, air conditioners to the California effect. Let's open it up to the audience. If any of you do have more questions, I've got some good ones I want to go over, but there's still time. If you're looking on Facebook, then just drop a question into the chat, tell us who you are, um, and then our team will, will send them over here. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, uh, then drop it into the, the Q&A. Um, Stephen, let me bring you back in as well. Um, so there's a question here, which I think would be worthwhile given we're in a, in a Singapore audience about RCEP, um, which has been the big news in this part of the world here. So um, Ed Edison Chung asks, um, in a sense, how does RCEP fit into this area? It, it's not a trade agreement, which has the kind of gold standard environmental uh, uh, build in that you have in something like the CPTPP, but can you give us a perspective on whether you think RCEP moves this conversation forward um, or not? I, look, here's, here's what I would say about RCEP. At a time when we see rising protectionism, trade wars and the WTO on the sidelines, any major initiative that moves forward on the trade and liberalization agenda should be certainly welcomed. And, and that's the case with the RCEP. However, I think it's been pretty broadly recognized that in a lot of respects, it's a fairly uh, sh a shallow agreement. So really isn't going to be uh, the, the, the game changer uh, that perhaps some other agreements might be. In terms of the sustainability agenda, I would actually, and, and you know, maybe I'm betraying my past as a, as a former uh, a trade negotiator when I say this, but I really wouldn't look to, to trade agreements really as being as the saviors uh, to drive sustainability. I think, you know, I was really interested, the, the panel discussion, by the way, was fantastic. And, and thank you very much uh, to the three panelists for an enlightening uh, conversation. Um, what, one comment that I would have added to the conversation though, when, when we talk about how to advance the sustainability agenda, how to encourage companies to move, engage in a race to the top instead of a, a race to the bottom. I really think we, we cannot underestimate the impact of civil society in, in a social media age when we can communicate so readily and have discussions on the practices, either positive or negative from a sustainability uh, point of view of companies. And this is important, you know, not only in terms of customers, it's important not only in terms of investors, but particularly with the younger generation, they are really auditing the values of the companies that they're considering going to work for. And companies are going to find, you know, that they have a very difficult time recruiting top talent, at least those who are tuned into those things, if they don't bring their practices and their values more in line with this. So I think really civil society and an active engaged civil society ultimately might be more important than an RCEP or any other trade agreement for that point of view. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So there, there, we had a question right at the start from Abhishek Bhatia. Let me read it out. The Brundtland Commission report centered around intergenerational optimization of natural resources. So how do we economically craft distribution focusing um, on, on these long-term issues? Ben, I think that's one for you. Well, actually, yeah, great question. I very much appreciate it. The Abhatland report kind of did two things. So it has, as Stephen talked about, the three-legged stool, how to be balanced, the three um, social, environmental, and economic goals. And it also talked about intergenerational equity as well. And so it had this kind of paradox between the one hand, improving human lives in the future and the present, but also how humans also impact the environment negatively. And how do we think about that kind of like paradox? And that's been always the challenge here. Are we trying to improve human lives both those who depend upon resources and in the future, or are we trying to save the environment from humans? This has been a constant tension even in this conversation. Um, I just wanna ask um, and relate to this then, this following kind of question to, the, to you in the audience, how would you handle the following dilemma that relates actually to the global trade situation and Southeast Asia? So 30 years ago, scientists found that an owl was going to become extinct if forest companies in the United States operating in Oregon, Washington, and California, the Northwest, harvested old growth forests. This owl would become extinct. And so strong rules came in place to say stop harvesting in these forests. Now, a trade think tank in the United States said, don't 
bring in these rules because that will simply shift harvesting from the US to Indonesia. That's what they actually said, it simply caused more degradation in Indonesia's forests and, and threatened species there, okay? So now what do we do? Because the communities in the Northwest said, also don't save the owl, there are jobs here. So let us keep on harvesting in these old world forests. And the timber companies said, yeah, don't let us not harvest in this. We need to balance a Brutland way, social, economic, and environmental. But the scientists said, if you do that, the owl becomes extinct. The owl becomes extinct. So my question is, when you're faced with this actual dilemma, what do you do with the Brutland, um, and this is the question really, the Brutland metaphor. How does the Brutland metaphor help us with this dilemma that can't be wished away? What do we do? Very good. Okay, that, that's um, I, 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 we, good, good way of discussing this. I, I hope this owl survived in the end. I mean, and by the uh, way, uh, the, but the opposite is the orangutan in Borneo, right? The orangutan is the, um, the countervail effect to the owl. You've got an orangutan that needs habitat, an owl that needs habitat. In both cases, they're causing livelihoods and jobs to become reduced. So these aren't mm. things we can wish away. How do we handle them? And that's kind of behind the question that we just got on the front end. These are tough issues, right? We have, a, we have a question from someone who didn't give their name, but I like it. It says, in a world where there is a divergence of ambition and action on sustainability, is there a danger of unilateral action by some actors? Or I guess maybe not enough, not enough action by some. Will there be fragmentation of amb ambition and action? And Arunaba, that, that's one I, I, I thought for you. I mean, so A, you're based in India, and so India has a kind of particular approach to this, but you look across the piece at how different uh, nations are, are attacking this challenge. And again, I'm thinking in particular of the COP process next year. I mean, is there anything more that you could say about the, the, the sort of tensions in this position and who has to, to lead on this kind of agenda? The first thing we have to recognize, James, um, and whoever asked that question, is that we've made an error in assuming that climate leadership is a crown that can be only worn by one nation at a time. And we spent more than two decades of negotiations after the UNFCCC was originally drafted, figuring out who would wear that crown. And then we came to 2015, where basically we said, you know, no one needs to wear their crown, but everyone needs to wear a hat. But and you decide what is this going to be the shape of that hat, how wide that brim is going to be, what's going to be the color, and you come and tell us uh, what that plan is. And that was that bottom-up approach that got us to a deal. However, the problem is that if one of us stops wearing the hat, the party doesn't look very nice. So when the biggest hat wearer decides to leave the party, then everyone else begins to take off their hat. When you take off your hat, it begins to look like a funeral, not a party. So this is the problem. The problem is not who will do more. The problem is what will it take for everyone to do something, right? And it's this absence of trust that continues to kind of embed itself or uh, in, into any conversation that we have on climate. Therefore, I have a different solution to this, notwithstanding President-elect Biden's um, strong promises of coming back into the Paris Agreement and, and getting others to do more. I think we need to structure a multilateralism around chronic risks. What I mean by that is generally when we do trade negotiations or we do climate negotiations, we focus on interests, our common interests and we then we try and negotiate relative gains and losses. And that almost always results in some degree of stalemate till somebody or the other figures out a way to find compromise. But everyone wins, but one wins a little bit more than the other. Structuring around not common interests, but common dilemmas or common aversions is what is everybody's interest in avoiding. Everyone wants to avoid a pandemic. Everyone wants to avoid a global food shock. Everyone wants to avoid extreme weather events. Structuring multilateralism around these chronic risks focused on things that we want to avoid might actually reignite some basis of trust and working together to build the resilience against the, the risks that climate change poses before us. 
Um, we can do that with insurance mechanisms. We can do that by, by working out the kind of risks different regions are facing. We can do that with pooling risks and reducing the risk profiles uh, so that our insurance costs come down. Um, just one last data point on this. Wimbledon got $141 million in return for its pandemic insurance that it put, took out about 15 years ago. All the low-income countries in the world put together got $132 million from the World Bank's pandemic insurance bonds. Wimbledon, $141 million. All low-income countries, $132 million. That kind of inequity in the insurance cushion is not going to get anyone to act on climate change unless we figure out a multilateralism around chronic risks focused on pushing back against our common aversions. Very good. Thank you. That was a, it's an excellent way of thinking about it. The idea that, in a sense, form follows function makes a, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, final question for you, Sophia. So Patrick Flynn uh, asks an interesting question. He says, hyper-globalization showed countries to attract businesses. It had to make tax or regulatory concessions. And so you ended up with what people call regulatory arbitrage. And so he says, it strikes me that in order to get governments to focus on things like labor standards, you need to make um, things more attractive to corporations. How, how can you do that, Patrick asks. I know that this is an area that, that interests you in, in terms of human development. So in a sense, what kind of rules can you make um, that, that will uh, encourage businesses to improve standards? You know, I think um, one of the things is that what can, you know, before we get into like, what can governments do to ensure that, the, you know, that, that corporations do that? I think, you know, Stephen was saying at the beginning, like civil society, plays a major role and as we heard like even the young um you know the the younger population is kind of expecting it right so um young people companies that are trying to hire I mean, we had an example of like you know we heard from the chief sustainability officer of levi strauss in in the bay area who you know it was, it was a newly created position because um they found that a lot of the people that they were interviewing we're actually asking them that what are you doing about you know i'd love to join levi's but what are you doing to make sure that your practices and like your factories in bangladesh are sustainable and whatnot so you know i think that the impact of the young as well as the civil society is going to play a key role and then of course you know what do governments then do i mean you know you set some core just like you set core labor standards you set some core you know environment standards as well as you know providing some kind of incentives um or you know credits to go along with that very good well so we promised that we'd end on time at 6 45 and so we're, we're going to wrap that up there this this is a conversation that could have gone on a lot longer and that was really interesting i i think i mean from the the californian effect and this poor old owl we still didn't quite find out whether it survived mm -hmm. or not through, it did it survived it survived it survived okay yeah. excellent good, good news story <laughs> Through, through to uh, through to the future of air conditioning, uh, labor standards, uh, it gives a sense of the sheer complexity of this area. But as I said in the beginning, I, there really are almost no um, uh, policy agendas that are more important than this one uh, for the, the long term. And so I suppose I would um, recommend that uh, you can download a copy of the Henrich Report, uh, which is a good place to start. Uh, you can also visit the websites uh, of the Asia Foundation or CEW, which is packed with interesting work, uh, or indeed go and read some of Ben Kishore's papers, all of which will provide some insight on this. So um, I would like to thank now, I, I, yeah, exactly. We all need to wear a crown or a hat of one sort or another. So this is another lesson that we can take out of this. Next time, I'll expect you all to come behatted or becrowned to our events. <laughs> anyway, on behalf of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and the Henry Foundation, many thanks for joining us today. Thanks to those of you who asked questions. Those were some excellent questions as well. And thank you to Stephen for his presentation and my three panelists, Ben, Arunaba, and Sophia. So thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank evening. you all. Bye. Bye.